Today we're starting a new series, looking at the big questions in life. Why are we doing that? Because our goal is to see the church full of people who are flourishing, who know who they are, who are filled with the Spirit and therefore empowered to do the God, good works that God has called them to. Because they love God and they have enough of His love in their lives to share it about with others. So today, and in two weeks' time, because we're taking a break next week for our special guests, uh, we're talking about intimacy, the scariest word in life. Firstly, today we're talking about intimacy with God, and then in two weeks' time, we're going to talk about intimacy with others. So let's pray. Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you that you can be close. Thank you that you've designed us for a relationship with you. And as you've designed each of us differently, you want us to discover what it means to grow in intimacy with you. That we would understand the love that you have for us and understand the plans that you have for us and that we would live as we looked at last, life, last week, in abundant life, and to understand the fullness of that. In Jesus' name, amen. So here's a question. You don't need to raise your hand, but feel free to do so if you want. Who here would like to have a better relationship with God? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who here would like to hear God's voice better? If the answer is yes, then the next question is how? How do we do that? Here's another question. Who here has a dream that you want to see come to pass? Or who here is, has heard from God, heard him speak, but that dream is yet to come to fruition? It might be buried down deep inside of you, and you're asking God, when is this going to happen? How do I get there? You see, Ephesians 2.10 says, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, ahead of time, that we should walk in them. And in John 14, Jesus says in verse 12, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will they do, because I am going to the Father. And it's clear from these verses that God has plans for us to excel and to be a blessing to the world around us, to be fruitful, to have abundant life, so how do we become the types of people who can see God's plans fulfilled in our lives? And the answer is by developing our relationship or our intimacy with God. And why is this the key to success? You see, last week, Easter, we talked about the reasons that Jesus died. Firstly, it was because of the hardness of the hearts of humanity. It was people who killed Jesus, not God. Secondly, it was to show God's love. He came and died upon the cross so that we would understand what it means to be loved by God. Thirdly, it was to fulfill prophecy, as Carlos mentioned in um, the communion. God came to show us that his word is true and we can live by it because Jesus came according to prophecy. He lived according to prophecy. He died according to prophecy and he rose again. And the final point was that he is our archetype. What that means is that we live in the pattern of Jesus. He's the model upon which we base our lives. Philippians 2 verse 5 to 11 says that Jesus came to earth as a man rather than as God, even though he was God. And why did he do this? He did it to show us how to live so that we would have a fleshly example to follow. He lived a life of blessing others, being entirely faithful to God's calling on his life. And God's intent is that we, the church, would do even greater works than he did. And how? By building our lives on the pattern of Jesus. So does this mean copying Jesus exactly? No, it means seeing him as an example, as proof that God can and will use us to transform our lives into something meaningful. It does not mean that we need to grow a beard, though we may if we want. Wear a sash and sandals and have 12 smelly men follow us everywhere we go. We don't need to be exactly like Jesus. 
And I think sometimes we get a little bit trapped into thinking we need to be exactly like Jesus or exactly like our favorite pastor or the traveling missionary who came once, spoke five years ago and jammed 25 years of success stories into a 30-minute sermon and inspired us to live that kind of life also without taking time to consider that their life and mission might be completely different from our own and we're not meant to be the same as other people. You see, Jesus is our example. How many of you have heard of WWJD, those bracelets that people used to wear a while back? WWJD, what would Jesus do? And I understand the meaning behind it, but I always wished it was WWJHMD. What would Jesus have me do? See, life is all about seeing the example of Jesus, being encouraged by it, but then finding out how to apply the principles of his life in our own. It's not about copying Jesus, but it's about being like Jesus. He's our example, but God wants us to live our own way, um, our own style, however he made us for in relationship with him. So question, how did Jesus have such a great ministry on earth? After all, he was a man from birth to death. He laid aside his godness, if you will, and lived as a mere mortal. So how did he do it? You see, Jesus was successful because he was 100% obedient to God. And he spent a lot of time in prayer with God. Have you ever noticed that in the Gospels, he'll talk to hundreds or thousands of people, deliver an amazing sermon, and just when you think he's going to amp it up, he just runs off and he goes and spends time with God. Why did he do this? Sometimes he seemed totally desperate to escape his ministry and to spend time with God instead. Why? Because he knew that he needed God's direction in his life for the next thing, for the next day, what to do. I think sometimes we, we think that Jesus just knew what to do because he's God. But he received direction from God. He was anointed by the Holy Spirit in the beginning so that he would be able to have that relationship with God, to be able to receive from God and to live following the steps that God had for him. And it's the same with us. We don't just figure it out. God leads us, and we have the Holy Spirit so that we can do that. You see, intimacy with God is what enabled him to then speak again the next day, or to know that he was to spit in a blind blind man's eyes, or to stay back on the shore and then walk upon the water to meet the disciples in the boat. He didn't just come up with these ideas. He didn't just have these ideas automatically in him because he was God. They came from his relationship with God by the Holy Spirit, the very same thing that we can have in our lives through times of prayer and God's leading. So what great news that is for us. We're not God, but we can have a ministry like Jesus. He lived as a man and was led by the Father, and so can we. We can be led by God. In fact, with God, we can achieve even greater things than Jesus did, the Apostle John writes, because he is with us, leading and guiding us into great plans that he has for us. You see, the works that we do, which God planned for us ahead of time, as we read in Ephesians 2.10, they come out of a living and vital relationship with God the Father. And that's why Jesus spent so much time developing his intimacy with God. He was filled with the Holy Spirit and empowered to act and to live out the plans God had for him. But in order to know those plans, to know what they were, to be able to then go and do it, to be able to talk without necessarily listening, but to be led by the Holy Spirit and to act at the same time. Jesus was intimate with God the Father ahead of time and received instructions from him. Now, another way to look at it is this. When it comes, out to, comes to working out the vision for your life that you have received from God, there are two elements that must have come together in order for you to be effective. One is strategy, and the other is tactics. Strategy is like the grand plan. It's like the blueprint, if you will. But tactics are the daily decisions that you make in order to see that strategy fulfilled. Say you were building a house. You'd need, among other things, an engineer, an architect, and a builder, and a few hundred thousand dollars for the council. But the engineer and the architect would work together to come up with the design to make it so that it's not going to fall apart. And then the builder is the one who goes and brings it to life. And they make the daily decisions about which way to place the timber according to how 
it might bend or have a, a nog here or all those kind of things. They make the dis daily decisions about how many nails to use, how to fix it all together in order to make that structure come to life so that it ends up being more than just plans on a piece of paper. And so it is in our lives. We need that blueprint from God, whether it's a piece at a time or whether we figure it out in hindsight. God's got plans for us. But we also need input into our lives for the daily tactics to know what to do today to see those plans come to pass. We need to develop intimacy with God so that while we are out, even if things haven't been revealed to us ahead of time, we can sense where God is leading us, sense which words to say, sense who to talk to and how to encourage them. And without these, we'll never be able to take steps toward our goals. And no matter how great the plan was that God had for us, that house will never get built. So how did we develop intimacy with God? The first of three points is desire. See, desire is a very misunderstood concept. How is it misunderstood? I want you to consider this question for a moment. Where does desire come from? Is it something that happens to you, or is it something that you do? Consider maybe one of your great vices, whether it's lust, gluttony, shopping, chocolate, whatever it is. Where does that desire come from? Does it come from the enemy, from other people tempting you? Sometimes. Does it come from within? See, James 1 verse 12 to 16 says, Blessed is the one who remains steadfast under trial. For when he's stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when they're tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Here's the key. But each person is tempted when they're lured away and enticed by their own desire. The desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Note, each person is tempted when they are lured away and enticed by their own desire. You see, temptation may come from external forces, from the enemy or simple circumstances, just happening to walk by whatever it is that tempts you. But it's our de desires deep within that create the opportunity for that temptation. Likewise, desire for good things comes from a decision, not from an external force. Desire for God is something that comes from within. And yes, there's an element of pursuit that God has for us. He wants it too. He wants us to develop that relationship with us. But for those of us who have already been pursued, especially those of us whose relationship with God may have not been now what it once was, who may really want a relationship with God but really struggle with it, what we need is to stir up that desire for God, to reignite it. Again in James... Chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. In 1 Timothy 1, 6 to 7, it says, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you. So desire is something that we are responsible for. And God promises that there will be a reward. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. I know some of you might be thinking, I just don't have the desire right now. I'm too burnt out, too busy, too beaten down from the last time I tried to stir up the gift. I don't know if I have it in me to try it again. I might be like the guy on the video who just ends up falling asleep, waking up early and then falling asleep and having terrible sleep because I'm on my face or doing a headstand, however that works. And I know what it feels like. It's tough sometimes. But God promises in John 4 that his love is like a well, producing in you an overflowing river. He wants to fill us with that need, with whatever we need, so that we will never run dry again. And it takes dedication and effort, which we'll come to in a moment, but it's worth it. And faith is knowing that even if we can't see it, what God has spoken to us, what he has spoken to us in his word, or in those times when we've been full of hope and joy, that those things, even when we don't see them coming now, 
We can look back and say, yes, it was so true then, even though we can't see it now, it's still true and it will still come to pass if we stir up that desire, if we get right with God, if we draw near to him, then it might take a while, but he will draw near to us and he will help us and lead us in those things. We will do things greater than those that Jesus did. It's a promise in God's word. We've got to believe it, no matter whether it's a time when it seems so easy to believe, when we're young, when we're optimistic, when we're idealistic. We've got to believe it for our whole lives, no matter what we see in front of us. Otherwise, we don't have faith at all. So what do you do if you're not feeling it and don't desire God right now? What if you don't even have the desire to desire God? Concentrate for a moment, because I'm going to try and get a bit philosophical here. So you may not want God right now. You may not even want to want God right now. But everybody, no matter how they're feeling, can want to want to want God. Think about it. And if you haven't figured it out now, keep thinking about it until, until it clicks. By analogy, you might want to eat healthy because you know it's good for you. And keeping on eating unhealthy is bad for you. But right now, you're just thinking about the mince pies afterwards. Or the chocolate that you might have tonight or later in the week. You see, you may not want to eat healthy because you know that in the future you will want to eat those things. But you can always want to be in a place where your desire will change, that you will then want to become healthy. And if you're not in that place, you can always want to be in the place where you will desire to want to change. And it's the same with our desire for God. We can always choose to be in the place where we would desire to change, even if we're not yet in the place of desiring change. Does that make sense? So firstly, desire. It's up to us. Secondly, dedication. See, nothing worth doing comes easily. And I often think about the stages of life that we go through especially in regards to faith, particularly since I've been through a few stages and I know people who have been through a few more. And life now is very different from what it was 10 years ago, very different from what it was 20 years ago. I look at Josiah and life is so different for him than what it is for me. So we go through these stages. And it's a sad fact that in our, in our 20s and 30s, many people fall away from God and from church. Some of them come back when they have a young family, albeit some of them it's not necessarily faith-related. It's to receive some sort of values-based education for their children rather than returning as a commitment to serving God. So why is it that people fall away at this time? I think there are a few reasons. Firstly, sadly, many young people are not prepared for the onslaught to their faith that is to come when they leave the nest and discover the world. Now, I mentioned last week how I had just a couple of days previously bumped into a few friends who went to Bible college with me who had lost their faith or become confused and described themselves as spiritual people but weren't quite sure about everything that they'd grown up with. And they left the church and have entered basically spiritual purgatory, really at the mercy of whatever force fatally finds them in the future. So how did this happen? They mentioned to me the other day that their sheltered, conservative upbringing, they thought that was to blame. Now, I'm not saying we can't have fundamental conservative views. That's not at all what I'm saying. Or that we can't live according to the Bible. But we need to prepare our young people for the onslaught that's to come. Get them ready for it ahead of time. For example, one of the siblings to those who I've mentioned when I was in class with him, he stormed out because he was too challenged by one of the Christian lecturers. And he wasn't ready for that kind of challenge. And he grew from it, but it was good that it was in a safe place rather than just a, a challenge from outside. The safest place to be challenged is within the family home, within the church, within a place where people can ask tough questions in a loving environment. And if we don't even allow for or intentionally create this space, then they'll eventually seek answers by themselves outside the church. 
looking on the internet, watching videos about atheism, whatever it is, going off and finding friends who don't have the same beliefs. But if we can foster that kind of environment and allow people to ask the tough questions, we can help mitigate against that a little bit. Second, life sometimes just gets hard. You see, in our small group last year, around half our members had their toughest year in life to date. Some were battling bullying bosses at work. Others had hit a dead end in their careers or felt like they had. Others had been promoted to a level that shook their core, managing other people. Others had relational struggles or COVID-related stresses. It was a hard time. And I think at some level we were not really prepared, firstly, for that to be a challenge to our faith, and secondly, for the isolation that last year created. It was only in hindsight that we really realized how tough it was and what we could have done better at the time. Thirdly, I think a lot of Christians have the expectation that we will always feel close to God. And then when that doesn't happen, we think there's something wrong, either with ourselves or we start to question whether God's really there. So why do we think that it will always be this way, that we will always feel close to God? I was talking with a friend um, three days ago, and his job is an outdoor, as, as an outdoor instructor. He does really fun, awesome stuff like sailing around the Hauraki Gulf with a bunch of teenagers on those old boats that used to do the Whitbread around the world, or helping out at school camps with outdoor pursuits designed to push high schoolers to their limits so that they would get a taste of what it is to be outside their comfort zone and go on to become great leaders. And one of the reflections that he had for me is that these, as a Christian he called them, Easter camp experiences, these moments of elated emotion and extreme challenges in a controlled environment, they're not real life. They're moments manipulated by good planning, designed to have an immediate effect. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not that we don't do those things. But although it may have been a meaningful experience for those people at the time, though it may actually provide some sort of impetus for change, it may give the why, it does not necessarily provide the how do I live differently, or the support that is needed to get people through the next phase of life. He said that he has these amazingly deep conversations with people, and, and they feel like they're best of friends for a week or a weekend or whatever it is, and then he never sees them again. And he doesn't have the the opportunity to have richness in relationship that carries on, just depth at one point of time. And I began reflecting on what this means for church. I began thinking about how many people have these Easter camp experiences as teens, and God is so real, and then they leave the church in their 20s or 30s. So why is that? I know for me, I really became a convinced Christian when I experienced God as a teenager in Mexico. I first understood the power of his love in my heart rather than just in my head while worshipping with a group of other people. And over the next 10 years, I had many experiences of God that convinced me of his existence to the point that I know I can never walk away. However, as life has gone on and developed routine and sometimes monotony, I have those experiences less regularly. And while it's true that I don't go on these camps anymore, these places where you do have the opportunity to have a manipulated environment that can create those moments, I haven't been on an overseas trip for a number of years, a mission trip where I see God moving in, say, Papua New Guinea or India or wherever. I no longer travel around Northland with a couple of my friends in a truck with four bunks on the back that my friend built doing open-air evangelism in small towns that you've never heard of. Yet there's a sense inside of me that we should be able to do real life and still have meaningful relationship with God. The question is, what should it look like? Should it look like the intensity of these moments? In reality, it can be expected that without those intense moments, those intense results may actually diminish. That just is logical. It just follows. Yet we often expect that our relationship with God should be intense, should be like that. However, I think this can be an unrealistic expectation for many of us. If you think about the rest of life, as time goes on, 
You compare life now with what it was like as a teenager, for example. We generally become less hormonal, less variable, less all over the place. We don't have these kind of extremes anymore. We may have them a little bit, but not in the same kind of way as we did then. Life is a bit more fixed. We have our families. We have our homes. We're kind of stuck in one place. We, we live for the security of the jobs that we have, all that kind of stuff. So we do have less mountaintop experiences. And life becomes a bit more of a slow grind. So there's a change that happens in us on that front too. And it's natural. The thing is, if we expect it, then it's not as threatening as if we don't expect it. We have these unrealistic expectations and then it happens. And I think we, many of us, myself especially, start off idealistic and romantically assume that things will never change. Here's an analogy I like to return to in these seasons. Think of a parent and a child. Now, the role of a parent is to prepare the child for independence. Now, imagine if a parent coddled a child forever. Imagine a mum standing at the school fence ready to nurse a five-year-old child. Or imagine if a parent never trusted their 18-year-old to move cities for uni, and the parent decided to go and join them in the halls of residence. We know these things would never happen, and the child is very, very, very grateful for that. Yet with God, sometimes we expect him to be close forever and always, in the same way that he was when we were younger Christians. But what if God is the perfect parent training us to be able to handle those times when he might not feel close? To know that he's still there, and just because we can't see or feel him for a season doesn't mean that we don't have his support. See, my dad's not with me in the room right now, but I know that he's only a phone call away, and he'll come running, but he's not here holding my hand. God is only ever a word away. So we need to adjust our expectations so they're not unrealistic. God won't always feel close, but that does not mean we can't develop intimacy with him. It just might look different in different seasons, and maybe more about trusting that he'll lead us even when we don't feel it, rather than assuming his apparent distance means absence or neglect. So thirdly, design. And I think this is an oft overlooked element of relationship. You see, every relationship we have is different. Imagine if we tried to fit every single relationship we have into the same template. Some would be entirely inappropriate, Others would just get confusing, and others just wouldn't work at all. Chaos would ensue. It wouldn't work. Likewise, we're all, differently, we're all different, made differently by design. 2 Corinthians 12 talks about the body being made up of different parts. We have different spiritual gifts from God. I think we know this about different spiritual gifts, but we don't, what we don't always consider is that we relate differently too. And this affects how we relate with God. It just has to. Again, I think sometimes we've assumed from stereotypical testimonies that God speaks in a certain way. You know the, the verses about Elijah not speaking in the stop, but eventually speaking in the silence. And the three-hour prayer sessions that missionaries seem to have from four in the morning daily. And some people are called to that, and it's fantastic. But intimacy with God looks different for all of us. The key is learning how God has designed you to relate to him. And we need to be aware that this may change as we change, as the seasons of life change. You see, I've had seasons where I walked literally with God for 40 days in the evening and felt him close. And as tempting as it would have been to keep that season going forever, God closed the door on that season, and life changed. I've had seasons where I've read the Bible daily for years on end, particularly as a teenager, and seasons when I haven't. There have been seasons where I've prayed for people and seen miracles or tangibly felt God's presence, and there have been seasons where I haven't felt it the same way. 
There's been seasons where I've prayed a lot and seasons when I haven't. Seasons when I've learned more than I've taught and seasons when I've taught more than I've learned. See, life is dynamic. Our faith is too. It changes and so does the way we relate to God. We can't expect it to be the same as it is for somebody else or even the same as it was for us once upon a time. So the key is to ask God, to develop that intimacy with him, to lead you into the way to grow that intimacy with him, for us to learn how to relate with him and to be aware that even when we feel like we've got it down, it'll change in the next season too. So just as we wrap up, I wonder how do you relate with God? Are you, say, an introspective type who needs solitude to hear from God? Did you find the video a little bit offensive because that's what you're like and you actually succeed in it? You're not going to fall asleep. Do you have a pen and paper ready for him to speak so that when you hear him, you write things down? Do you journal? Or are you the type of person who makes lists and then when it comes to prayer time, you pray for those things? Are you up at four every morning interceding for the saints? If that's who you are, That's fantastic. You're part of the body and you are so appreciated praying for all of us. Praying for the people that we don't necessarily remember to pray for. On the other hand, are you an external processor? Do you feel close to God when you're talking about him rather than talking with him? Do you feel close to God when you catch up with a friend and you have a powwow about life and you come away just feeling so excited that you've had this amazing time with somebody talking about God? Do you feel close to God, on the other hand, when you're walking through the park, whether it's alone or whether it's with someone else, when you're in nature, when you literally have mountaintop experiences? Are you like Eric Liddell, on the other hand, got four hands now, I think, or five or six, who from Chariots of Fire said, I believe God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. Are you the kind of person who, when you do things, you feel God, or you know that you're communing with God? See, we're all different, and we all need to spend time with God, however that looks, in order to develop that intimacy, and to grow with the sense that we can Understand where God is taking us. And when we do, we will be rewarded. So what will be our reward? Firstly, the destination. We will be with God for eternity. I'm always challenged by that verse which says, get away from me, you, even though you did great things because you didn't know me. And I think it strikes the fear of God into me a little bit because I'm like, oh, I'm not like this other person who has this kind of intimacy with God. But the key is to develop the kind of intimacy with God that he created me for, not to put external pressures on me. But to stir up that desire, to be dedicated to it, and then to have relationship with God according to the design that he has for me. And the reward will be the destination. Secondly, the reward will be the journey itself. When we enjoy the experience of intimacy with God here on earth, we find that his Holy Spirit in our lives brings growth. Intimacy with God enables us to process our emotions and reflect on our actions. And the Holy Spirit guides and also comforts us. Thirdly, fruit. When we begin to understand how God relates with us and develop that intimacy, We receive those tactics that I talked about earlier, that guidance from God. And it might not be that you spend time with God as as we think some people do, as we might assume was the way that Jesus did it. And then you know exactly, like a list in your head, you know, this person's going to come and you're going to point to them and say, look, I knew you, all that kind of stuff. It might just be that we spend time with God doing things and, and, and it's our spirit connecting with his rather than words, rather than taking time to listen. But because we're close with God, when it comes to that conversation we have with somebody else, we can sense that God's speaking through us. And afterwards we go, whoa, that was God. What came out my mouth was God. And I didn't know it was going to happen, but I just, I understand that I am walking in intimacy with God. When we walk in the plans that he has for us, we will see good things come to pass and there will be fruit. 
However, God doesn't want us to feel guilty because we fail to live up to false expectations, either from misunderstandings from ourselves or from expectations put on us by other people. See, Galatians 5.1 says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. What God wants for us is freedom. Freedom to love him. Not a yoke of slavery and a burden of feeling like we have to. This verse was in response to the Galatian church choosing to commit to routine and ritual instead of intimacy with God in order to appear pious. That's not what God wants for us. He wants us to have freedom and to choose to live with him and for him because it's the best way to live. So desire, that's our part. We need to stir up the desire for intimacy with God. Dedication, we need to stick with it. Thirdly, design. We need to figure it out with God how he wants to relate to each of us. To be prepared for this to be dynamic, for it to change from season to season. To not be exactly as it was another time. And not to get bogged down by unrealistic expectations. So every head bowed and every eye closed. You may be here today thinking about the plans that you know God has for your life that haven't yet come to fruition. It may be decades since those happened. It might just be a year or two. Perhaps you've given up or you'd forgotten about these plans until today. I want to pray for you now. Father, we trust in your word. We trust in you, that whatever you have spoken, you want those things to come to pass. That you want us to be able to discover the freedom of what it means to have intimacy with you. Not the yoke of slavery, but to walk into a new season of life and love with you, that we would see fruit. For all those plans that have laid dormant or feel like they have died, Lord, we trust that you will resurrect them if we continue to have faith. Faith that at once, a long time ago, those plans were so certain that we knew they were going to come to pass. Faith that even if it doesn't feel now like they will, to know that we weren't wrong at the time that we need to stir up the desire for intimacy with you. We need to keep that commitment and dedication to understand the design you have for us, that those things will come to pass. Or you may be here today wondering if God has plans for you at all. You may not yet understand what God has got for you, but you want to grow in relationship with him. Father, these people here who fit into this category, help them to be set free from the unrealistic expectation that you will treat them like you do other people. It may be that they will only know in hindsight the plans that you had for them. Help them to not assume that they have to have all the plans ahead of time. Help them to discover what it means to have relationship with you the way that you designed them to and to walk in that freedom. And for everyone who desires to know God better, who is willing to be dedicated to the cause, but who lacks understanding about the design that God has for them to relate with them, I want to pray for you now. Lord, we're all here because we love you and we want to know you. It may be that we're in a season where it's really tough. It may be that we desire to know you better or that we desire to desire to know you better. Or it may just be that we feel so cold and hardened and so let down that we're afraid to try again. Lord, for everybody here, help us to have faith like a child. 
to believe that you will resurrect those plans and purposes in our lives. To believe your word and to develop intimacy with you in the way that you have designed for us. Help us to be supportive of each other. To not forget these moments, but for them to be milestones and markers in our lives that we can look back to and continue to have the surety in other seasons to know that you had spoken to us at the time. Thank you that you're good and that you love us, that you want us to be with you in eternity, that you want us to be with you now, and that there will be fruit from our lives when we walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen.